Well, hey, podcast listeners, in episode 45 of the Pixar Post podcast, we're going to chat about award season for Inside Out and The Good Dinosaur. We're going to talk about some updated Toy Story 4 and Incredibles 2 news and our continued deep dive into The Good Dinosaur as we chat with story supervisor Kelsey Mann and writer Meg LaFove. But let's kick right off into it because it's something that's going to be upon us before we even know it, and it's going to be award season for Inside Out and The Good Dinosaur. And with two movies this season, it's going to be an exciting run for the Golden Globes, the Oscars, the Annies, and so on and so on and so so on. So I always kind of let Julie take the lead on the award side of it. And so I, I'm going to have her kind of like just update of, uh, you know, what the nominations are, what some awards that have already been won are, and so on and so forth. Yes, so I let's love, get into it. I love award season. Um, I mean, everything about award season is incredible. Um, but. Well, what about it? I don't know. It's just so exciting. And especially, like you said, with two Pixar films this year. I mean, this is an award season bonanza. (laughs) It's so exciting. Um, So let's get into it. So the Golden Globes, they have released their nominations and both Inside Out and The Good Dinosaur are up for Best Animated Feature. Mm -hmm. And so that is going to air on January 10th. Okay. And the Annie Awards, 25 Pixar nominations. That includes one for Sanjay's Super Team, Mm -hmm. 14 for Inside Out, and 10 for The Good Dinosaur. All right, so give us a taste as far as just general categories that they're up for. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Best uh, Outstanding Achievement in Storyboarding, Outstanding Achievement in Character Design, Best Animated Feature, uh, Outstanding uh, Achievement in Animated Effects, which... I think the good dinosaur will get that one. Well, we can hope. We can certainly hope as that's one of the things that everyone talks about with the good dinosaur is the effects and how amazingly mind blowing they are. Yes. I mean, it goes from voice acting for with Amy Poehler and Phyllis Smith uh, writing. There's so many incredible. Obviously with 25. It's it's like every category, basically. Right. Now, the Oscars, that is like my favorite. I look forward to it every year. Now, they haven't released their nominations. Those nominations aren't released until January 14th of next year, so 2016. But they have, um, Pixar has released their for consideration. Right. So what is the for your consideration? It's, it goes to all the members of the Academy who can vote. Um, it's members of the industry, uh, actors, so forth, producers. Um, and they can basically vote on what films they think should be included in these particular categories. Now, Inside Out, they are looking to achieve Best Picture nomination. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and there's about 10, I think, eight eight or 10 films that go in for Best uh, Picture for the Oscars. Um, they most likely will definitely get a nomination for Best Animated Feature. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if The Good Dinosaur will achieve that as well. Do you think so? For best animated feature, yeah, do you yeah, think? absolutely. I think okay. it, I think it'll get included in the list. I mean, there's a lot of contenders this year, but I think if you look at the Good Dinosaur and some of the you know back and forth that people have had, I think if you look at it from one element, you might say, hmm, I'm not sure. But if you look at it from the totality of it, from the story mixed right. in with the visual element of it, and some of those achievements, mm-hmm. um, I certainly think it has a chance. Uh, to be included in that list. And it's, I hate to say that I think it has a chance when I think that Inside Out is a shoe in Right. <laughs> it's crazy because usually the Golden Globes mirror the Oscars, like for nomination-wise. Mm-hmm. But I, I just think, I, I don't know why. I mean, the Golden Globes is smaller, but they're, they're so meaningful. They mean so much. But I just think, how crazy is it that Pixar has a chance to be nominated for two, like have two films in the Best Animated Feature that's pretty awesome. That's crazy. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, also up for uh, contention is Sanjay's super team for the Oscars. Okay. Now, they have made the short list, which there's 10 animated... <laughs> excuse me, I can't even talk. Mm. 10 animated films that have been um, up for consideration. They've, they've advanced through to the, through the first round of voting, essentially. Yes, and there's going to be five. Okay, that are going to actually move forward from there. Yes, I... Really, I've got my fingers crossed, my toes crossed, everything crossed, because this is an incredible short film, and it needs to be a nomination. Okay. All right. So, we'll get 
we talked about some of the the base features there, but as far as some of the other categories for the Oscars too, that for the four year consideration that Inside Out's putting forth, they're putting forth for best director, best original screen screenplay, cinematography, editing, art direction, sound mixing, sound editing, visual effects, and original score. And it's a very similar list for the Good Dinosaur as well. Mm-hmm. So it'll be really interesting to see how that pans out. But I think as we were kind of rolling through, let's go through and just recap the dates again of when things are going to be announced. So the Golden Globes, they're going to be announced. And they're, they're, out, they're announced. That's yeah. right. That's, they're out there, Best Animated Feature. But when, is, when are they going to air? January 10th, 2016. Okay. So then the Annie Awards, we already mentioned, those are already going through. Those have been announced as well since we mentioned the 25. When is that going to air? February 6th. And that you can stream online. Yes. And um, it is an enjoyable show. It is definitely worth a watch if you've never watched the live Annie stream. There's always some uh, quite humorous comments going on before they're officially on the air. Yes. And at some point, <laughs> at some point, there is a technical difficulty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's worth a it's worth a watch. And with 25, I mean, it's going to be back to back to back. Oh my goodness! That I we look forward to the Annies every year as well because. You know, we sit in our office together mm-hmm. and we just watch it. I, I don't know. It's it's always been a fun Yeah, night. it's a fun little thing for sure. Okay, so then the, the Oscars slash Academy Awards, same deal. Mm-hmm. When are those going to be announced and when is it going to air? Nominations are announced on January 14th and it's held, the ceremony is held on February 28th. So it goes Golden Globes, Annie Awards, and then uh, Oscars, the Academy Awards. So it'll be really interesting that the Golden Globes are going to be aired on January 10th. And then four days later, the Oscar nominations are going to come out. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see how all that kind of plays out and uh, if it'll affect. And that's generally how it is because it's always either like big upsets or big surprises. There's always a couple for sure. There's yeah. always a couple shakeups. Um, so it's definitely exciting. It's definitely interesting to see how it'll all shake out. Um, you know, I've already kind of alluded to it, but I mean, from inside out standpoint, even among the field of non-Pixar, I just feel like it it has to take so many. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, th- I I truly believe it will. I think a lot of people agree. The conversations on the forum are certainly leaning that way. Right. Um, and those are just the three award shows. I mean, the BAFTAs are going to be in there. The VES Awards, which is the Visual Effects Society Awards. Mm-hmm. These are all upcoming. I mean, we are hitting award season. Well, there's already been some, it's already among us, oh, so there's already true. been some wins as well. So what are some of the wins, and this is, if I'm right, only for the only for Inside Out. Only for Inside point. Out, yes. Okay, so what are some of the categories or, you know, yeah, the categories and the award ceremonies Societies. that they've won for, yeah. Yeah, so the New York Film Critics Circle, it won for Best Animated Feature. Mm-hmm. The National Board of Review, it was the top, one of the top 10 films of the year. Winner for Best Animated Feature. Gosh, the the Boston Online Film Critic, the Boston Film Society Critics, um, the Hollywood Film Awards. It won for the Hollywood Animation Award. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which they, they, those are always interesting because they announce it ahead of time. Yes. And then they just present it. So Pete Doctor was presented with it. He knew going in that he was going to to win that special award because they call out one. Yeah. And it was similar um, back in uh, 2013 when Dan Scanlon won for Monsters University. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and the Washington, D.C. Area Film Critics Association, it won for Best Animated Feature and Best Original Screenplay. Uh-huh. It's so many critics. Yep. And these critics are the ones that, you know, kind of have the pull. They can do the voting. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting to see their thoughts. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say if you're interested in the awards, obviously stay tuned to our site as well, because we are going to, of course, recap all of these as they keep coming out. But certainly we're going to make mention anytime in our show notes. Uh, And if you want to access today's show notes, it's just PixarPost.com. Click on the podcast button. And again, this is episode 45, and you can access all of our breakdown here. Uh, But also in the forum, we have a user in there, Reptile Patrol, that is definitely an awards expert. Yes. (laughs) And uh, he really breaks down all of the different award categories, kind of compares it to, talks about how the award groups uh, or the voting groups are completely different between Golden Globes and especially the Oscars. for these Film Critics Society awards, right? Because those are like smaller and harder to understand. There's so well, many yeah. of them. Yep. Yeah, it's hard when they start going at that level. But yeah. definitely check it out in the forum as well. Um, you know, give your thoughts in, in this as well as uh, read along with some of the others are saying because it's really interesting stuff. 
All right, so let's shift gears Ooh, a nice. little bit and talk about some Cars news for the week. All right, let's talk some cars. Let's get uh, let's get excited here for a minute because I love cars. Yes, you do. I love Lightning McQueen. Yes, you do. And I'm very excited that the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles has actually on, undergone a over a year long renovation, 125 million dollars. And as part of that, they said they wanted Pixar included in the museum. Now, before we get into what it is that's inside there. The picture of the outside of the museum, definitely hit the show notes on this because you need to see the outside of this museum. It is not just for cars. It's an architectural masterpiece. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And it's super cool. It's just cool, too. It is. It's got a really interesting vibe, and it just stands out right among like the, the other buildings in Los Angeles. It's an art piece. It is. Yeah, it absolutely is. So it, it's uh, Cars Mechanical Institute. And I'm going to read the first paragraph for the post that I wrote because it kind of just summarizes the best. So so whether you're an automotive geek or simply a fan of the Cars franchise of films, the newly renovated Peterson Museum's Cars Mechanical Institute is sure to capture your attention. Join Lightning McQueen and other familiar Cars friends as you're guided through an augmented reality experience into the rich technology, science, and physics that help build the cars of today. Voiced by the original actors from the films, guests will not only experience their favorite characters inside the Institute but also throughout the museum's other exhibits with a digital scavenger hunt. So really cool. How cool is that that the Pixar Cars characters are integrated throughout this museum? Yeah, so I think what they had said is that uh, you go into the, the Cars Mechanical Institute. There's If you've ever been to, whether it be Walt Disney World or Land, and they have the, the life-size Lightning McQueen, mm-hmm. they have one of those in there. Um, and then they have a wall where you can push buttons... Like it says, like, how does combustion inside of an engine make it move forward? Or how does a car start? They have all these different sections that you can push buttons and then you see actual car parts on the wall moving and doing things. Like they show how uh, struts and those kind of things work. It's really kind of really cool. That's cool. And it's automated. Oh boy, <laughs> just like my shift gears yes, at the beginning I had to of this. Do one. I had to do one. <laughs> So yeah, definitely head to our site and view some photos of inside the Institute. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, a big thanks to Motor World Hype for giving us a heads up that they actually had an interview with Jay Ward, who is the Cars franchise guardian. Yes. Uh, (laughs) um, That they sat down with him for a seven minute interview and they kind of dig into how he kind of fell into his role as the guardian, his passion and actual legit knowledge of cars, which is super cool to see. And a bit of history about uh, Motorama, which is Pixar's biannual uh, private show. car show. Absolutely. So definitely worth a look. And then there's also, we also link through to another video um, to see not just within the Cars Mechanical Institute, but also the full tour of the updated museum. So if you're interested in cars, definitely check it out. If you're interested in the franchise of cars and Lightning McQueen and all those kind of things, definitely check it out. If you're in the LA area, Go there. Let us know what you think of it. We definitely want to hear some insights from, you know, Pixar fans as they get into the museum and start digging around. Uh, So really, really cool stuff. So, oh, also an interesting side note. As you go into the Mechanical Institute, there are these cars pads, which are essentially like little touchscreens. And that's what guides you through with a scavenger hunt. But uh, the animation on those was actually done with the by the folks at Disney Interactive. Uh, Pixar was maxed out between three back-to-back films. You know, obviously from Inside Out, The Good Dinosaur, Finding Dory coming up. That they leaned on the Disney Infinity manufacturer, so Disney Interactive, to help with that animation. We thought that was a nice little partnership that, that they pulled there. That is so interesting. Yeah, gotta love that. You know, collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, it's collaboration between the Peterson Museum to get the cars in there, and working with Jay Ward and all those kind of things too. Yeah. So. Really interesting stuff, but absolutely, if you do head to this museum, or if you know someone that has, definitely let us know your thoughts on it. We'd love to share them uh, with the rest of the audience, and then also just gather them ourselves. Well, we'll continue the trend of bad puns from one incredible news story to the next. Oh man, now I'm going to have to think of another pun. (laughs) 
So in case you missed it just a couple weeks ago, uh, it was closer to Thanksgiving, but we wanted to make sure we brought it up on the podcast too, just because it was so exciting and incredible, (laughs) is Brad Bird tweeted out a short video of Michael Giacchino signing the official contract to score the upcoming Incredibles 2. Yes! I know. I mean, like, could anybody else do the Incredibles, though? No. Right. So that's... (laughs) It's obvious. Beca- it's obviously exciting because Giacchino's work that he did on this film was the first one that kind of caught audiences' ears on a broader scale and brought his unique taste to Pixar films and and films in general to the forefront. Um, but uh, don't get uh, too excited as of right now, though, because obviously the film is going to be out in quite a while. It's actually going to be hitting theaters on June twenty first, twenty nineteen. Well, we have some time. But we'll take the news and we'll run with it. How about that? Yes. We'll dash with it. Oh, Oh. there it is! (laughs) (laughs) Well, with The Incredibles coming out in a couple of years, obviously there's other news that's more in the forefront that's generating a lot of buzz. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Toy Story 4. You're on a roll. (laughs) You are on a roll. How about that, eh? Yeah, that one threw me off. (laughs) (laughs) The forefront? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, well, you know, you got to try to find a way. (laughs) So uh, with, (laughs) I don't even know where to go from that one. (laughs) So yeah, so that one will be coming out on June 15th, 2018. Um, And Tom Hanks recently stopped by the Graham Norton show uh, to chat about some of his upcoming work. And that's actually the show he talked to uh, a couple of years back about who voices Woody in like the dolls and the stores and those types of things. And he talked about that. It was his brother, Jim. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that. It was brother Jim. So in this, in this chat, um, he brings up that he started recording Toy Story 4, or, or that at the time he was going to begin recording Toy Story 4 on December 2nd. Mm-hmm. So his first Pixar studio days back in the recording booth for Woody uh, just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. So just last week. So it's really exciting to hear some of this. So let's listen to a clip as he talks about exhausting his diaphragm and getting into battling some of the Disney lawyers and those types of things as he may or may not have so speculated if number four was coming out. And the recording sessions go on for four or five hours. So I always come out of recording Toy Story sessions. We're, we're now recording Toy Story 4, so uh, we, we, we're doing that. Is it dem- it'll be out in 2018, as a matter of fact. So it's, it takes a long time. But my diaphragm gets a workout because the, ent- the entire... G- guys, come on! It's like a- <laughs> By the time I'm leaving, I'm driving home, and I literally have to put an ice chest on my diaphragm just so I can go home because it's clenched through, throughout. Wow! So Toy Story Four—that's act- that is. Uh, we are working on it right now. Yes. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a recording session on the second of December. I'll I love you. that uh, that Go noise on. in that's the lovely. audience. That's, <laughs> you know what? I, I, somebody stuck a microphone in my in my face at some point in something. They said, "Is there going to be a Toy Story 4? And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I think so." And I got a call from the Disney lawyers the next day. <laughs> You contractually are not allowed to discuss a Toy Story 4. It will affect the stock market price of the Disney common stock. So you are no longer... I said, hey, I'm sorry. (laughs) But let me just point out, I'm Woody. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Tom. (laughs) Always a funny guy. Definitely, I I like that he just puts it out with with the lawyers. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously when he said it, he didn't know at that point. No. They don't, they're not letting them know that far in advance. I mean, sure, with some of the stuff, they might tell him things, but he didn't know when they did that. And in fact, they didn't know when they did the Muppets. Remember Muppets Most Wanted at the beginning of it? They're like, when where we wait for Tom Hanks to make oh, Toy yes. Story 4 in the yes. opening song. I mean, like, everybody was like, this is what it means. Nobody knew at that point. That was all a joke. And Disney, obviously owns all of this whole world Muppet, of yeah. everything. So they're, they wouldn't have allowed that to happen if it was like... If they knew truly at that time. Right. So anyways, thought that was kind of cool. I also think it's really cool because uh, Tom Hanks actually, he did his December 2nd voice uh, recording session at Pixar Animation Studios. So why is that significant? It's significant because a lot of the time when they do vocal work, Pixar actually goes down to Burbank or they'll fly to New York and meet the actors there Mm -hmm. in their own like, you know, hometowns because most of them are working. Right, you so know, they have to kind of squeeze this in between their other right, projects. And Tom Hanks is working on a film right now if he hasn't already wrapped on, you know, on it. So right. I thought it was really cool that he actually went into the studio. Yeah. 
A fun fact is, is <laughs> I believe that Larry the Cable Guy, he has done all of his Mater work in Pixar animation that's studios. That's what we have. That's, that's what we what have heard. heard. Yep, absolutely. Um, Tom Hanks, too. You mentioned his role. A lot of people kind of commented on the picture of Tom Hanks that we had on the post that we did with this news. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, my gosh, he looks so old now with all of his gray hair and everything. And what's going on? So what what film was he going for? Um, He is actually I don't know if it's wrapped yet, but he's working on a film uh, where he is the pilot that successfully landed the plane, uh, the American Airlines plane into the Hudson River. Right, absolutely. So, Was it Captain uh, Sully? Captain Sully. Right. So yeah, so he's doing that. So if you see his image and you're like, oh my he's goodness. He's a little white mustache and white hair. Right. So he's playing a pilot. Yes. So <laughs> he's been in a couple movies now where planes have gone down. I mean, he's got Cast Away where he was not the pilot, but he was in it. He's, he's got the, the captain now. <laughs> he's the captain now. And I'm trying to think back. Boy, this is going way back. But Joe versus the Volcano, one of his early Meg Ryan films. How did he get stuck on that island with her? Was it a plane? I don't I don't remember, yeah, but I saw it in theaters as a really young kid. <laughs> so interestingly, don't think that Tom Hanks is looking as gray with the mustache as he is. It's all part for the role. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about our deeper dive into story with story supervisor Kelsey Mann and screenwriter Meg LaFove. Um, this is a session that you were at when mm-hmm. you were at the Good Dinosaur event uh-huh. to kind of dig deeper into that. Um, as I think about Meg LaFove, she was a screenwriter for Inside Out as well as for The Good Dinosaur. She might as well be an official Pixar employee at this point and just yeah, she's like been live busy. there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know she's like bouncing from one to the next to the next. So I thought that was kind of cool. But so for people that have listened to this podcast before, mm-hmm. they obviously know your your passion and your love for Kelsey Mann. I it's the enthusiasm. It's just like Mark Andrews. They just have this passion and and the enthusiasm that is so... Uh, it, it's invigor- contagious. It, yeah, it invigorates yeah, you. Invigorating, that's a good way to put it. It makes you want to chase your dreams and chase your passion. Yeah, so what's interesting is when I was listening through and editing the interview that you had recorded with them, which we're going to play in just a minute, mm-hmm. I wrote down, I feel like Kelsey could sell me anything, and not in a bad way, not like a shystery way. Yeah. Like literally, like he just, he believes in things so much that like you pick it up and it's it's just like what you're saying with like the infectious thing yeah. like you're just like wow that's a great idea and like all these other kind of things like it's just it it's just that flows. enthusiasm it just makes you realize what you want to do and just like i can do it right so you obviously ran into him at monsters university mm-hmm. uh at that at that event mm-hmm. i ran into him at the studio just in ch- by chance when i was there for inside out Um, and passing each other, he's like, TJ, and I'm like, Kelsey. (laughs) So what was it like bumping into him again? What did you guys do when you guys saw each other? Oh, it was just awesome. It's like, hi, hi. Yeah, yeah? I I just, I I love story. I think that is just an incredible department. Um, I wish my drawing skills were better. Uh, I, that would be my department, I believe. Well, one of the things he talks about in here is you don't necessarily have to have these amazing drawing skills. You need to be able to convey I know. So you can convey. I guess so. <laughs> just just got to work at it. I know. I have to listen. I have to listen to this interview again and then just reinvigorate myself to know that I can pursue my dreams. Well, there you go. So, okay. Well, Kelsey talks about in the interview how excited he was to hold the session in the room East Side number six. Yes. East Side six. East Side six. So since we hear him chat about the room so much and... You know, he really digs into the importance of the room. Since you were in the room, describe how it looked and also how he made it sound like he made it sound like it was really far within Pixar. Like he's like, we have to come all the way. I'm so glad that you guys came here to East Side Six. So how was it like getting there? And then what was it like when you were in the room? Describe it. It's on the second floor of the Steve Jobs building. It overlooks the atrium. So we're, okay. you know, in the middle section yeah, okay. of the Steve Jobs building. Uh, it's like a like a conference room. Um, a long table. Um, I believe it was an even longer table, uh, like a newer, longer table to accommodate all of the artists. Okay. Um, now, when we were there, there was only two, like the Cintiq Wacom tablets. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. There was one at the head of the table and one to the left mm-hmm. of the head of the table. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that was that was now. That was what now. Was it? But before, when they were all there, it was just all. 
of those tablets everywhere so all the artists could draw mm-hmm. on it um but really it was a, a dimly lit room mm-hmm. in i don't know the way he's talked that this is where it all happened mm-hmm. it was like wow this is where it this is where the good dinosaur happened where it formed yes so the fact that he spoke so highly of, I can't believe you guys are here. We're having this session here. Right. This is where everything happened in here. Right. Like, <laughs> right. like you, we talk about you want to be a fly on the wall at Pixar. You were sort of there. I felt like I was that fly on the wall just a little too late. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> to see so, everything happen. But, so if you definitely want to see some of these pictures, um, you can head to our website and you can click on, of course, the podcast mm-hmm. uh, show notes, episode 45, and we'll have some photos. In fact, we've already got them in there that, you know, it shows the room with them in it right. with the story team in it so you can see all of the Cintiq tablets up and then there's one with some of the press in there so you can see just the individual ones you can definitely get a sense for what this room was like so really really cool stuff there you also hear at the beginning of it right after it kicks off that you can hear Kelsey saying oh I wish you sat here this was Pete's spot and he's referencing of course to Pete Sohn so who is he saying that to he was talking to me <laughs> He wanted you to sit in front yeah, well, of... Yeah, because when we first came in, we came in, he, you know, we said hello to each other. He's like, oh, sit anywhere. Well, there was two Cintiq tablets, that, you know, at the table. I didn't know if Meg was going to sit at one. I didn't know if he was going to sit at the other one. I didn't want to sit in front of one, I of, totally get it. one yeah. of those tablets because I was There's like... There's only two. If there was if there was one at every one, yeah, you obviously I, wouldn't have found anything of it. I didn't know if he was going to use it, get on it or anything. So then when he said that, I was like, whoa. <laughs> you should have got up and moved. I know. <laughs> um... So yeah, so before we get into the interview as well, for all the artists out there, I really enjoyed his insights into using the Cintiqs versus paper. He talks about the Cintiqs allowing the ease of drawing multiple versions, layering, resizing, but that you're constrained to where you're going to draw. You're going to draw in front of this Cintiq. Um, then he, talk, he, of course, compares that against paper, the, the portability, the freedom of it to draw anywhere, wherever your inspiration takes you for that day, but then you have the technology trade-offs, and he talks about all these crazy things in the past about how when he would draw on paper and it was too small like if he would draw one of the characters too small he had to take it to the copy machine and he'd have to blow it up and then you'd go I don't know what is that 50% I gotta increase it (laughs) and you try that and then you cut it out and you're like that doesn't work but it's just so amazing that like these are things that like we take for granted Mm because we don't do this on a day to day basis and until you're in the weeds on it you don't start to get these types of things because when you first get a Cintiq or any type of drawing tablet, you're like, wow, this is so awesome. And you feel inspired again. Mm-hmm. But as you start to use it and you're like in the doldrums of working on a project and you're like, I just need to kind of get out of here for a little bit. Well, you can't really run around with that whole tablet that you got to have plugged in and have power to and all these kind of things. So it's really interesting to hear some of those insights as far as he does that. So I thought that was really good. Um, really good insights there. So let's play the interview now. We'll catch up with some more notes and get some more of your thoughts as far as you know what you thought when he pitches the scene and all those kind of things. So stay tuned and we'll uh, catch up afterwards. But here's the interview with Kelsey Mann and Meg LaFove. Hi, my name is Kelsey Mann. I'm the story supervisor on uh, The Good Dinosaur. And I'm Meg LaFove. I was the writer. Yeah, and uh, uh, I'm super excited for today. Typically, these kind of talks are done in like a conference room or a uh, screen room, right? But with this one, we have the opportunity where I'm like, can we have it in East Side 6? And that doesn't mean anything to you. It means a lot to us because this, this is our story room. This is actually the room that we did it in. And uh, I can goosebumps. I get excited because like usually this stuff's like in the back and you're like, you can't come back here, you know? But this was our space. It was a nice large room. We had big, nice windows. And uh, uh, this is where we made the movie. And uh, we were in here for years. Yeah, we were. Yeah, so you can feel like I just feel like the blood and the sweat of filmmaking, like in the carpet and some of its actual blood, and in uh, the walls, like I just feel the DNA of the of the movie in here. When I, it's weird. Like Meg and I haven't really been together for a few months, but like it's honestly really strange to see all these faces around this table so I kind of feel like you're like my story team like right now <laughs> this is pretty cool because this is this is where it happened you know and this is like uh, I was hoping you'd sit here this, this is actually Pete's own spot right like this is where he sat you know and I, I, that was Rosie's spot you know and like people kind of just naturally took a, took their, their, their kind of spot in this room and I have so many memories of making this film in this room this is where this is to me like we don't have a set 
like when we work on a film, we don't get to go and like, there's the Millennium Falcon, like, ah, uh, and there's the actors and like, you know, grips and uh, here, this is this is what felt like working on a set of a film because it was all of us in here together. Uh, so to talk about kind of uh, about this room, we did something a little bit different on this movie uh, with our story room. So in order to, I kind of want to rewind a little bit and talk about story rooms. So this is where it all began. This is uh, Walt Disney. Era. This is Disney, and this is this is his story team. And uh, uh, I didn't really describe this, but I work in the story department, and our primary job is to take Meg's beautifully written words and uh, translate them into the visual medium uh, of a film. And they, so they yeah. will draw the whole movie, and then it's taken on into edit. And they put music, they put scratch dialogue in, and then they project it in the movie theater in front of 300 people as if it's the movie. And we get notes from those 300 people, yeah. and we get notes from the brain trust based on that movie, and then we go back to the beginning and take it all back down to the studs and rebuild it, and they draw it again. So they do that many, many, we watched the movie many times, but from somebody coming from live action was an incredible experience because you're actually getting to make the movie yeah. and see what we thought worked on the page does not work, or it works and it works better than we thought, we have to go that direction. Yeah. You know, it's, was, it's an amazing experience. Yeah, we learn a lot, and, we, and we, the way we do it is like, we get through our drawings, you know, rather than like having it animated and lit and like, uh, that's expensive. And if it doesn't work, it, you know, you so just it waste all the time. Right? Yeah, exactly. And all we throw away are our drawings. Um, and so you can see that's how it began. In the early days of Pixar, it was pretty much the same. You know, there's John Lasseter and there's Joe Ramp. He's got his pitch stick and there's all the drawings pinned up on a board. And so it really remained the same for many, many years. And that's the way. Uh, that they made the films here in the early days of Pixar. And then this came around. Uh, it's funny, when I said this, I kind of felt like I was saying Pete Sohn. <laughs> he did come around, he's very special. Um, and uh, he's working on a, a, a Wacom Cintiq. And that's what I have here in front of me. Every story artist has one of these. And Pete is boarding on Ratatouille. I don't know if you guys know or not, Pete was a story artist before he became a director. And he is one of the best story artists that we have at the studio. Everyone looks up to that man because he draws like it's nobody's business. Uh, and so here he is, he's working digitally, right? So I'm working on a, a program called Pitch Doctor. And like, yeah, I'm gonna have a seat. Like I can create um, a new board and I can just sketch like right on top of it really like quickly. And see, I can undo and I can like, okay, there's Arlo, there he is, like happy face, you know? And I can flip my pen around and I can like erase and I can flip back. Really great tool, right? And what was so nice about it is that um, I can, like if I drew on paper and if I drew it too small, I'd be like, oh, I gotta go to the photocopier and I gotta walk down to the photocopier and I gotta, like, I don't know, 52%? I don't know, <laughs> man, it comes out and like, oh, damn it, I'm wasting paper, I feel bad about that, and I'm like 65, you know. It's, and then I have to go back and like cut it out and like paste it in and it's just really tedious because I'm not doing one drawing, I'm doing like hundreds of drawings. You know, a sequence can be anywhere from like 300 to like 1,200 drawings. It's a lot of drawings. It's just one sequence. Of yeah, totally. So it's a, it's a lot. So I do not miss boarding on paper. I, <laughs> this is my friend. I love these. So, um, there, a lot of positive things came from this, but some negative things came from it. We didn't really realize over the years, uh, until over the years. And um, with like a piece of paper, I can go anywhere. I can go in the atrium, I can go outside, I can go into your office or your office. But like with this, like I can only draw where there's one of these. And where are these offices? Or where are these? You know, it's in people's offices. So everybody like a, like a bear in, in winter, you know, would go hibernate. <laughs> And that's not animation, it's not Pixar. This, this is Pixar, this is animation, it's collaborative. We're all together in a room and bouncing off of each other's ideas. You know, how can we bounce off of each other if we're literally alone all the time? So Pete and I really wanted this and Pete's like big. Pete was like, Pete, like, Pete was like tear down the walls, no walls, like all of us working together. And so that's what we did, we created this room and we called it the bullpen. So this is kind of our like digital story room. And the difference between this room and a story room was we don't just meet in here, you can work in here. So this table, the one you're around right now, it's a little bit different because we had to switch it out, but these were all filled with antiques. The main one and filled, right? 
So you had a choice, or you had a choice to come and work in here if you wanted to, or if you're like, you know what, I just want to today, I just want to focus and be alone and just work, then go in your office, or come in here. And what was so great about it is that when you're working on these films, it can you can get like um, like Meg was uh, you've said like sequenceitis, where you just know just your part, and you lose like what's going on in the third act, and how does what I'm doing relate to that, and this room made it feel like we were all on the set of the film working together on the movie versus your little sequence. And like, it was so great because like, you know, Austin over here, like here's Eric Benson, our story lead on the show. And he's, you know, working on a scene with Pete. And Austin can be like, hey, what if, what if Arla said this? And you're like, oh my God, that's hilarious. Like Meg, put that in the script. It was a really collaborative uh, environment to be in. And you could just you could just feel the energy in here, and everyone just bouncing off of each other because there's so many talented people here, and you want to put them together, not separate them. And so that's how we worked. And uh, this is at the height, you know. It wasn't always like you, sometimes you come in here and there'd be like two or three, you know. But sometimes you come in and there'd be like twenty, you know. It was really exciting uh, to to work in here. Uh, and yeah, a lot of times we would just like this isn't uh, this is not a meeting. This is us just working, you know. And there's there's Meg. Where's Meg? The storyboard artist called me after they set up the room and they're like, look, we made you, you have a chair. Yeah. You, need to work, you need to write in here with us. And I was like, okay. It's much more fun to write in here with all these guys than all by myself. Yeah, it was great. So like there's Meg working and there's, uh, she's working, you know, writing probably at, like part of act one. And then, you know, Domi and Rosie are boarding like other parts of the movie. So everyone's working really hard here. Um, I guess Pete's really not working, he's just watching the movie uh, right now. But we would do that, we would put on movies uh, for inspiration, or we'd just play music, like in here. It was a really great environment to be in. And so, uh, the process. Uh, you know, every movie is kind of different, so we had a very specific way to work on this movie. And so it started in a room just like this. Yeah, and it started with what you know, I'd call the core four. It was Pete and myself and Kelsey and then Eric, the, the uh, uh, story guy. and. We, you know, my job is to pull the story out of Pete. It's his movie, he's the director, he's the well, he's the source, it's his vision. And so my job is to just constantly go back to him and as we're getting ideas, but Pete, how do you feel about that? Is that, are we on course, are we right? I mean, I have to own it too, I'm the writer, I have to create it on the page, but I'm able to own it because we get down to something so human that everybody can own it and understand it. And, you know, that's not easy to do, but it, you know, like you said, it takes a lot of personal stories and you're talking and trying to get down to it. Um, then we're trying to, once we kind of get, okay, this is what this movie is about, this is who Arlo is, this is the main relationship, this is how he's going to change, you know, what we kind of see it in big general ways, you know, we've been charting, we've been using whiteboards, mm -hmm. we will eventually card right. the whole movie up in sequences, so that is the whole movie, from the first sequence to the last sequence, we're using different colored cards because I want to see the relationship moving because everything has to keep evolving, every sequence you're evolving the character, you're evolving the relationship, because if you're not... Why is it in the movie ultimately? Mm -hmm. So we would kind of really put the movie up. We'd have to pitch it to the brain trust guys. We'd come in and yeah, would have to get pitch up, it. Pitch it. And if we couldn't car. pitch it, I would know we weren't ready because Pete should be able to pitch it because it should be his now. He should be able to really feel like it's his. And eventually we're like, okay, it's time to go to pages. And then, you know, those sequences are still just very the surface action. You know, Arlo walks in to the cabin, gets in a fight with Buck, gets upset and leaves. That's not writing yet, right? We don't have a story yet. That's just surface action. So I have to go down. Who is Arlo? And well, how does he talk? And what is his behavior? And would he really do that? And I can change it from there. Like, guys, I got in here. I can give them different versions. I don't think that end works. When you actually get in here and you actually see it as a story and a character walking around, I think he'd do this instead. Let's yeah. talk about it. So I'm starting to get pages back to the core four. And we're doing it again. We're going through. We're ripping it up. We're seeing it again. Different versions. I like this version. I like that version. And then eventually you can start to see, okay, it's solidifying. This is going to be what we need to board. And then they take it into the boarding process. I'm there too because I'm mm -hmm. there to help. But pretty much now it's moving to the storyboard artist to make it a visual experience. Yeah, well, it was great. We would come in this room right here. And uh, there's Pete on the left there. And he's got his, uh, his binder. That's the whole movie right there. And he has the script that we're handing out to Edgar Carapetti, right? And again, like this bullpen. This conversation would just be like the two of them with like a couple of production people in the room. But like there's the story team, the whole story team is around the table. And they're hearing, you guys have probably gone and talked to like Mike V and animation, like they have dailies. 
and everybody. It's not just the people showing the work to, that come in. It's like the whole department. And hearing someone else get notes about another part of the movie helps them do a better job on their part. It's the same thing here. They're having the conversation about the film. And Pete's saying things like, you know, all right, Edgar, uh, I want to, you know, I want Spot to be really tenacious. We gotta really set this up at the beginning of Act Two. And then maybe JP's like, uh, I'm not being that tenacious in my scene. Maybe I should amp that up. Or Edgar's thinking like, okay, he doesn't know how. Like sometimes he's like, uh, Spot needs to do something like crazy and tenacious. I don't know what. That's why I'm giving it to you. And then Edgar's like, tenacious, okay, how do I do tenacious? Or JP may be like, hey, what if he rips apart a tree with his bare hands? And then Pete's like, ah, oh, that's great, Edgar, try that. Okay, okay, you know, and we're having this type of discussion. You know what I loved about Pete? Like, this is some of my favorite moments when it would hand out to an artist. Because, like, Pete, you, you, you come in this room, and if he was, like, handing out, you know, to, to you, he'd be like, come here, like, come close, like, look me in the eyes. Like, I need you, here's the script, I need you to bring your heart to this. I need your love and you'd be like yes Pete I'll do it I'll do it for you like he did, it was so cool because like the, the worst thing you have as a story artist is like here just uh, just draw it up okay be like hey what about this idea just draw it up dude you know and you're like ah. then you just feel like we call it like being a wrist we don't want to just be wrists we want to use our, our brain like our ideas but more importantly like our our, our heart like, what I love about this room out of all the rooms in Pixar, this is my favorite because it's like a safe environment, and it and it needs to be that way because we're 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 dealing with story and we're dealing with characters and we're dealing with emotions. And, it, and what I love about Pixar is it doesn't matter if they're toys or if they're cars or if they're dinosaurs. Like they have to emote real feelings that people can identify with, even though he's a huge dinosaur. And Pete was always great yeah. at wanting everybody to bring their heart because he understood that. The more you bring, the better this movie's going to be. It's not just about doing what I say. Yeah. It's about, okay, you make this better. I yeah. trust your talent, your skill, what you are bringing to the table to make it better. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So real stuff, it's kind of like part therapy in this room, you know, because we're talking about real things. You know, we're talking about, like, our experiences as kids or the experience of, like, our, our, our children growing up and, like, my son, like, you know, going, trying, doing baseball and he's not very good at it. And uh, like I'm worried about it, you know, and, and like uh, we we talk about that, you know, and and we put that into the movie, you know, a lot of who Arlo is is who we are, and and especially Pete, number one, you know, it's all about him. So what we're trying to do is find real emotions. So people, we laugh and we cry in here. That's why I love this room. It's it's honest, and and we try to put it up on the screen. So if we feel it, we're putting it up on the screen, and hopefully. You, you guys will feel it when you see the movie. You know, nothing pisses me off more when you watch a movie and you just don't, you're like, you're being disingenuous and you're being fake, you know, and I know it. And you can feel it when people are being real. So, uh, sorry, I feel like I'm on a soapbox. <laughs> uh, yeah, go for it. So, um, Edgar will go off, Story Alex will go off, and then they'll thumbnail things out. And some people do it like right on the script here. And so this is Bill pressing. This is him, this is him like thumbnailing all over the script. And what I love about this is it's just for Bill. And it's, kind of his way, like it feels like I'm peeking in his brain, like how do you think, Bill? Like this is just like what's going on in his head. Um, and then once an artist kind of goes through that, they'll rough it in the Cintiq like I kind of did for you guys, like really quick, but hundreds of more drawings. And then we come back into this room and I'm in kind of the hot spot, like right here. This is, uh, you can see my, my monitor is being mirrored up there. And Edgar is pitching. And so what I love about this, here's Edgar. No one's looking at Edgar, just like you guys aren't looking at me right now. You're looking up here. And that's what it's all about. It's taking Meg's written word and putting it up, and visuals up on the screen. And so what Edgar is doing is pitching the scene to everyone in the room. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch you guys the scene so you get that. The story's all about truth and feeling, so I'm gonna do it so you can, uh, you know, feel it. So I'm gonna pitch you a scene done by this fabulous face right here, J.P. Vine. This is one of our story artists. He got a scene called Follow the River, and I'm gonna focus just on this little sentence. Arlo keeping a distance but following the boy, uh, that spot. They break from the woods and Arlo finds himself uh, back at the river. So we all gather in this room, and it's like, okay, J.P., take it away. And I'm playing the part of J.P. So we see Arlo, 
Arlo's like walking through the woods, like looking through the trees, like where'd that little guy go? Not paying attention. When snap crack! Oh, 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 It's all misty, mysterious, and he looks around, and all of a sudden he hears a little, and he turns around, and we see this little gopher staring at him, and then he like goes into a little hole. Arlo's like, oh, what the? And he, he backs up, not looking where he's going, and then steps on a little gopher who like angrily barks at him. He's like, oh, uh, backs up, and then Spot like comes out of nowhere and jumps on top of him. And Spot's like, oh, and he goes through his hands like, oh, 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 oh. And then, oh, the little guy scares him, he like shakes his butt, and then <laughs> jumps on top of him, and he pops out another little hole, he's like, what the, looks back at him, jumps on top of him, pops out another hole, jumps on top of that one, he pops out another hole, he jumps on top of that one, and then, boom, all of these gophers appear all around him, and he like, slowly looks around at all the gophers. <laughs> he runs around really crazy, barking like nuts. Arlo's like, what a crazy little critter. And he chases this little critter and he like, goes down in a little hole. And then Spot like, ooh, gets an idea. <gasps> and blows the little guy out another hole off in the distance. And Arlo, uh, Spot like, <laughs>, laughs and looks over at Arlo. And Arlo's like, okay, and looks down and sees a little hole by his feet. So he takes a big breath, <gasps> blows into the hole. He's blowing, but the gopher is kind of stuck and he kind of just wobbles back and forth and then he drops back down into the hole. And he looks back at Spot. Spot goes, <gasps> beep, beep, and blows out two more little gophers and like turns back and I'm like, huh? And then Spot's like, huh? Uh, I was like, okay, tries again. <gasps> blows into the hole. Out comes a gopher, followed by another gopher. It's like a totem pole of gophers and then they all drop back into the hole. And he looks back at Spot. Spot goes, <gasps> beep, 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 and throws out, uh, blows out three little gophers. Arlo's like, all right, I've had enough of this. Takes a big, <gasps> huge, <gasps> dinosaur breath. Boom! Hundreds of gophers, woo! Go flying up into the air, and then they come raining down, one by one by one by one by one. And Spot is just like, whoa! He's never seen anything like this before. And then one more guy drops to the ground. And then all of a sudden, all the gophers go, whoo! And turn towards him really mad. And he looks down, and a little guy goes, and bites him on his foot. Ah! Ouch! 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 <laughs> Looks back at the gophers, and then they all just like slowly go into the holes. So you see, thank you for applauding, Nick. Thank you for applauding. It, it, it is like part. It's actually kind of tradition, uh, but it's like part performance, you know. And you guys like, you know, uh, nobody interrupted me. Like it's, and what I'm trying to do is have everyone in the room watch the movie and feel that sequence. And if it's, if it's loud, I'm gonna be loud. If it's silly, I'm gonna be silly. You know, uh, uh, if, it's, if it's an emotional scene, I'm gonna drop down and I'm gonna do emotional with all you guys. Like, be nice and quiet and I want pacing. Because what everyone's doing, it's not just the story team in the room, it's also the editor and it's the technical soup and uh, the producer, like, every, and, and, and Meg is in here. And we're all watching to see if the movie works. And it well, works that's good a great enough, example you know? of, he, it's not just a joke, he's evolving the relationship, he's evolving character, he's saying, you know, Arlo is frightened, but he learns to push through it, and then he's also saying, look, the boy showed him to, you can play with your fear. Mm -hmm. So that's when you're, you're starting to get gold, because they're taking what's there, and they understand the story, and they're saying, if that's the story, this is how it could, you know, that this is how it could change your life. So, um, and sometimes jokes come in, and you're like, that's really funny, but that actually knocks other things down later. So we have to have a bigger discussion about that. Yeah, and, and you can see, like, did you guys see that, by the way? Like, I don't know what you've seen and haven't seen, but yeah, that's in the final film. I love that about Pixar, and I love that about working on this movie with Pete, because he, he like, went to JP and said, I need you to bring something, you know? And, and people bring it in different ways. Like, again, that's, like, kind of, a, you know, funny, like, like, JP was just drawing, and then he was like, he could have just moved Arlo from point A to point B. He could have just have him follow him and then show up at the river. But JP was like, I got an idea. And then he, this is his son's squeaker toy. And he was just like, he didn't even tell us he was going to do that. Like, I didn't tell you guys. 
he just started pitching, and then he just went, and we're like, whoa, oh my god, JP, that is hilarious, keep going, keep going, that is so funny. And, uh, like I say, like, there he is, that little gopher. And sometimes the design, like, he didn't have a design for that. He just drew it, and it's really rough, you know what I mean? But you can still get the idea. Like, I love this last shot. Look how rough that is. But it is funny. It is freaking funny. We cleaned that up, and we ruined it. You know? We're like, oh, it's not funny anymore. Like, there's some magic about this really rough drawing, you know? And, uh, and then, uh, really, then that gets passed off to animation, then, to... to capture this feeling, you know? And uh, you can see too that's a little bit different from what you guys saw, because that's like the first pass, so you always kind of like cut down to its core, or I believe we ended up doing something later in the movie where we're like, oh, we need, Spot needs this little bloodhound like technique, like we should, we should like set that up. Like that earlier, you yeah. can just show up later that he can sniff things out, oh, yeah. he can sniff out the gophers. Yeah, totally. So there's this like back and forth of like plussing the movie in different areas, you know? So yeah. he didn't collaborate with anybody, he just kind of did that on a whim and then Yeah, I usually I usually check in like if an artist if you get handed out a sequence and you you get handed out on Monday and maybe you pitch on Friday, okay. I'll check in with you halfway through. Like on on Wednesday, be like, How's it going? You know, do you wanna show me what you got or uh, are you hitting any roadblocks or do you need more time? Sometimes it's like, Oh, this is, I need two more days. You're like, Okay, let's do it. Um, and so, but that one particular one, I don't remember him showing it to me, like halfway through, he just did it, like, we were moving pretty fast, uh, uh, on this movie, um, but I love surprises like that, you know? Uh, so, it's funny, like, Meg and I have not been in this room for, like, many, many months, so, it's really weird, to be honest, like, seeing faces, like, around this table right now, I feel like you're, like, my story artist, so uh, we need, we totally need to do a drawing. Grab a, grab a pad of paper <laughs> grab a, and, and grab a Sharpie. So you're in the story room, we have to do a drawing. I'm going to teach you guys how to uh, draw Arlen. That sound good? Yeah. All right, cool. All right. The, ever, the effervescent Kelsey Mann and <laughs> Meg Lefauve. Uh Really interesting stuff there. So there was a couple things I took away, but first let's talk about this drawing of yours. How did your Arlo turn out? I think my Arlo turned out okay. You went really high there. I know, because I'm never... <laughs> I, I'm always critical. <laughs> well, see, so as I was listening to it, and I didn't include the part where he says, like, draw a circle and all those kind of things. I figured for, for this it would get kind of um, harder to, to follow. But I was drawing it as I was going to, and I was like, even mine, when I was done, I was like, you know, eh, I could have done that a little better. I would have done that. But see, that's the thing with story. You're doing, you're doing, you're doing. He talks I know, about, you do so fast and you do so many, but it's like, you know, when you don't do so fast and so many, so many times, and then I look at it, I'm like critical about it. Of course. Of course. Well, plus they're, they're giving you like a, a smaller pad of paper and a Sharpie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't work with Sharpie often. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, gosh, you know, I, you know, you you hold it landscape and like, did I put his nose too close to the right? Did I put it too Yeah, high? he said that with one person. So he goes, well, let's just start again. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was too big. That wasn't yours, was it? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so other fantastic notes to hear from here. I I personally took away something that I hadn't thought about either. I mean, I have, but you know, you kind of forget these kind of things. And this is why it's important to study and restudy and never quit thinking about and relearning things is where he talks about the instance of getting sequenceitis, um, where you only know your part, your individual sequence that you're working on, and you lose the focus of, you know, what's going on in the third act and how does what I'm doing relate to that? So I thought it was really cool hearing how as a team, if you're all working in that room and you're all bouncing off of each other all the time, you're avoiding sequenceitis because you're always in it. You're always, you're not just so focused on your one sequence and getting it dead perfect Mm -hmm. that you're, you know, you're being agile with it. So I thought that was a great lesson out of there. Um, But talk about his, his pitch here, because one of the things that we talked about leading into it was that. Kelsey talked about that the you know the the rough sketches that JP Vine did of the gopher yes. uh, popping out of the hole and all those kind of things. Um, it didn't have to be perfect, but it read properly. So talk about a little bit of the, about experiencing that live, seeing the pitch, and surprising with the squeaker. Did you see it come out? Did you expect it to happen? Those kind of things. Yeah. So it was really interesting because the night before, that was actually one of the scenes that we saw in the theater. So it was fully rendered, fully done. We had seen that scene. So when we went to the story, um, you know, talk and Mm -hmm. Kelsey showed this presentation of JP's, it was incredible because it was almost to the 
point perfection of what right. it was on the screen. From the story standpoint. From the story but standpoint. But how were the drawings in comparison? Almost exact. Okay, so, but, like, the quality of them. A- amazing. Really? Because he yes. talks about the fact that they were really rough, and he they're tried rough, to... They're rough, but he, they're... But you get the good. idea of yes. everything? Okay. Yes. So that, there's, well, that proves the point that it was, like, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's rough, but there's detail in it, you know, especially when all of them pop up. I, it, you just feel motion. Mm-hmm. You feel, like, the flow of it. You feel humor in it. Mm-hmm. You feel the speed Mm -hmm. Of, like, them popping up and falling down. Um, You know, and, yeah, we did see him grab something in his hand with the squeaker. Okay. And then he just squeaked. And it was loud. It was loud. (laughs) I had to turn it down on the audio a little bit. Yeah, and he kept doing it. And uh, (laughs) it's it's that. It's the presentation. And I don't think it's just Kelsey who, present. you know, does his presentations like this. I think. Oh, yeah, no, it's the story department for sure. That is just an incredible thing well they have to learn that's part of what they have to learn how to do is the presentation and they talk about you know acting in improv classes and all these kind of things to help it's amazing and that's that's what you know stimulates me Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm yeah the pitch process we Mm -hmm. saw that with um it was obviously a little more subdued when we saw it when i saw it for inside out because it was a joy and sadness scene and obviously ronnie del carmen was doing the sadness part and he's you know having to stay sad right so it wasn't like this like hearing critters popping up in the sky and landing and squeakers and all those kind of things. But it's really cool to see the dynamic of kind of both ends of that spectrum Mm -hmm. and hear that both are necessary. You don't always have to be amped up. You don't always have to be, you know, just kind of calm and casual. Um, As part of the Toy Story 20th anniversary, there was a pitch process from Joe Ranft where he talked about the the Green Army men where they had the boards, uh, you know, taped on their feet, you know, nailed to their yeah, shoes, the shoes and all those kind of things. But it, it was his pitch of that. And there was some audio from that that was out there. Uh, it's actually on Inside the Magic uh, net on their episode. They have the, the full audio of the Toy Story 20th anniversary um, special that they did. Not the special, uh, but the actual presentation in California. And definitely listen to that if you want to check that out for sure. But anyways, I, I diverge. But that pitch <laughs> process was so... Again, it's so amazing to hear that when they've had, when they've nailed a scene, like when JP nailed this one, Kelsey talks about that, you know, he didn't really follow up with them on this one. He didn't continue to say, hey, how's it going? He said, like, JP just nailed this one out. So when a scene really comes together and it just hits right, it really hits right. And it's so cool when you have those moments where, like the, the Joe Ramped one where it was recorded, or in this case where you've got Kelsey pitching it and we can hear it happening. It's just so unique and so great. And that's exactly, you said it perfectly. You can hear it happening. Not only yeah. can you see it, you can hear it. Yeah. And I think that is a good portion of story. Not only have to, you have to visualize it, but you have to hear the excitement, like th- like the emotion that you're supposed to feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it all has to translate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really cool stuff. So uh, you excited for the next time you run into Kelsey? Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope it's uh, sooner rather than later, eh? Yeah. All right. Well, I think that about wraps up this episode. Be sure to stay tuned for our next one as we'll, of course, continue our deep dive into The Good Dinosaur. Not sure exactly where we're going to go with this one. We might do some production. We might do a little bit of effects. You know, we're not sure which episode will be next, but certainly stay tuned and we'll bring them all to you as we uh, unravel more and more of The Good Dinosaur. We were kind of holding back a little bit till people saw it just so that way as these things were revealed, it wasn't as spoilery. So... Hopefully uh, you've all got a chance to see it now and can start absorbing this extra information. All right, well, like I said, that about wraps up episode 45 of the Pixar Post podcast. Be sure to follow us on all of our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Periscope, Pinterest, Tumblr, YouTube, Google+, and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Overcast, or Stitcher. Lastly, if you like today's show, let us know. Rate us on iTunes, leave a comment on our site, or send us an email at info at pixarpost.com. Signing off as usual, I'm TJ. And I'm Julie. <laughs> and be sure to stay tuned to pixarpost.com all week for the latest Pixar news. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.